This lecture is on population ecology. So population ecology is the study of populations and the factors that affect them. So just to remind you, a population is a group of individuals of the same species that occupy, occupy um, the same general area. And the sorts of factors that um, population ecologists are interested in are things like the density or the distribution of individuals in space, how that population is growing, changing the sorts of factors that are affecting growth. And this field is important both for humans and for animals. So for humans, uh, population ecology style studies are often called demography or demographic studies, and those are used to help towns and cities plan their growth, the number of schools, uh, medical facilities, and so on. Um, in uh, wildlife ecology, uh, the study of populations is very helpful for uh, things like figuring out if a, an endangered species needs the adults to be protected or the juveniles to be protected. For organisms that are invasive, um, ecologists often try to target which part of the life cycle is the best to uh, kill them. So for example, if you have a scorpion infestation in your home, um, you might want to figure out if it's more important to kill the adults who are reproducing or to kill the babies. And population uh, studies can help you with that. So we focus on factors that influence the density, structure, size and growth rate. And we use it to study how to develop sustainable fisheries, how to control pests and pathogens. If your doctor does this, they try to figure out how to kill the population of bacteria that's uh, causing for you to have strep throat, for example. And we also use it for population growth, as I've mentioned. Now, what are the major measures? Well, we have population density, and that's the number of individuals per unit of area or volume. And um, in some cases, we can measure it directly, such as counting. Um, in other cases, you would have to use an indirect indicator, such as the number of nests or burrows. Oftentimes, um, not every individual in an entire population is measured. Sometimes what will happen is the ecologist or doctor will take out a small sample, count how many is in the small sample, and then extrapolate that up to the entire study area. The age structure of a population is very important. This is the distribution of individuals of different ages. So how many juveniles, how many adults, how many reproductive individuals. And the age structure is helpful because it helps you to see the history of survival of individuals in that population. It will give you an idea of reproductive success and how that population is related to environmental factors. So here's an example of some cactus finches. And when you look at that age structure, what you see is that most of the population is age four. And you have this gap where you have no two-year-olds and no three-year-olds. So what happened? Well, it turns out that um, three years ago and two years ago, there was a drought and all of the babies, that all the eggs that were laid were not able to be fed appropriately and so they died. Whereas four years ago, they had some good rainfall and as a result, most of the fledglings survived. Here is um, a description of population momentum in Mexico. So in 1985, that's your first panel, what you see is um, that you have a very wide bottom to the age structure. This is actually called an age pyramid. So if you look at these first three rows, these are females who are 0 to 4 years old, 5 to 9, and 10 to 14. And if we come back to that area of Mexico in 2010, those individuals who are aged 0 through 14 are now in the reproductive age category of 25 to 39. 
and the next set of children that are being born in 2035 will reach that same age category. And what you can see when you look at these three different panels is the shape of the age pyramid whoops, is actually changing over time. So in 1985, when you have this very wide um, bottom to your pyramid, what that means is that you've got a large number of juveniles or children. By 2010, those have aged and become adults. But then they are not reproducing as fast as would be expected if they were reproduced as fast as their parents did. And so you have a population that is slowing its growth over time. You also see, if you look at the um, blue uh, parts of the category, these are people who are 45 years old and older, that we have a graying of this population. So now a much larger proportion of people living in Mexico in 2035 will be in the 45 and older age group. This indicates that we've got better health care and people are living longer. So you can read a lot into an age class pyramid. We also create something called life tables. These help us to track survivorship. So one way to do this is to follow a cohort. That's a group of individuals um, in a certain age category, and you follow them as they transition into different age categories. So in this table, um, it was a following of 100,000 individuals who were ages 0 to 10 years old in 2004. Um, and what you find is that um, the number that survived through to the next age category, right, you have uh, 99,000. And then over time, these people are dying. So you can calculate the chance of surviving to the next age group. Now, when you're very young, you have an almost guaranteed chance of living to the next age group. It's not 100% because sometimes, sadly, children do die. Um, but what you'll see here is this number stays very high, close to 90%, until you reach about 60 or 70. And then it starts to go down. Um, and between 80 and 90, the number goes down dramatically. So what you can do to compare different organisms and their survivorship is you can actually plot their survivorship on a curve. And it turns out that we've got three main survivorship curve types. The first is a type 1, and that follows um, that of a human being, so a type 1, where most of your life you have a very good chance of surviving to the next age category until you get pretty old, in which case your rate of dying increases dramatically. We have type 2 survivorship curve, and a really good example of this would be a squirrel or a bird. And you have a pretty much equal chance of dying at any point in time in your life. So think about it. A squirrel or a bird whether it's young or old, has got a fairly equivalent chance of being run over across the road or being um, food for a hawk. The last type of survivorship curve is called type 3. And in this, um, juveniles have a very, very poor rate of surviving to adulthood. But once you've survived to adulthood, you live a very long life. Um, so. Examples, this funny picture, that's an oyster. Most oysters die before they reach adulthood. I would have preferred the example of a sea turtle because that seems very familiar. Think of how many tiny baby sea turtles are born, but most of them never make it to adulthood. But once um, a sea turtle has made it to adulthood, it has a very low chance of dying and it can live a very long time. So population ecologists use population growth models to predict the changes in populations over time. The population size will change as individuals are born or die, come into the area, or move away. There are two main growth model um, patterns that you need to know for this class. The first is the exponential growth model. This is 
growth that happens in an unlimited environment. Your iconic image for this is rabbits breeding. They can breed exponentially, which means that over time they're going to be breeding very, very fast. So from uh, one generation to the next, the numbers are increasing and increasing and increasing, following what looks like an exponential curve. It looks like there's no end in sight to that population. But if the planet is a closed system with respect to nutrients, you know that you cannot have this exponential growth continue forever. There are limiting factors. These are environmental factors that hold the population growth in check. It could be that there's not enough food for all of the individuals. It could be that there are not enough nesting sites for all individuals. It could be that once you reach a certain number of individuals, diseases can pass really quickly and can kill them faster. So this is where we need to come up with a different model, the logistic growth model. And the logistic growth model incorporates the idea of a carrying capacity. That's the maximum population size that an environment can sustain. And what happens is with the logistic population growth, the growth rate increases exponentially until you approach the carrying capacity, at which time you have a plateau. So this picture here shows the increase in the population of fur seals on the California coast after um, the ban of um, harvesting seals for fur occurred. Now, the carrying capacity varies. It really depends on many features. The species, the resources available for the habitat. So if you change your habitat, so for example, if humans destroy habitat, that reduces the carrying capacity for an organism. Now, populations are regulated by different factors. One set of factors are the density dependent factors. These are factors that increase as populations increase. So the more individuals there are, the more poop there is. The less food there is, the less territory there is. The fewer individuals in a population, the less poop and the more food and the more territory. So as you can see, you have competition between individuals for limited resources. And as those populations increase, competition is going to get fiercer and fiercer and so an organism may spend all day trying to defend its territory rather than eating and so its ability to survive and reproduce will be compromised. There are other factors that are called density independent factors. That means it doesn't matter how big the population is, these factors will just nail you. So an example could be a fire or a flood or a storm. These factors um, can affect a big population or a small population. Most natural populations have density independent factors limiting population size before density dependent factors become important. So for example, you would have a drought that would that's an independent factor that decreases the amount of food and that's before your population size became large enough that you were experiencing the accumulation of toxins. But over the very long time, most populations have both density independent and dependent factors regulating them. And some populations have got regular cycles of increase and decrease. And one of the best studied ones is of snowshoe hares and lynx. So the lynx hunts snowshoe hares, and they're very dependent on eating snowshoe hares in order to survive. And so what you find is that when the snowshoe hare population is uh, increased, it's very high, you have very low lynx population. What that means is that there's lots of food to go around, and so the baby lynx survive very well. So then you have an increase in the lynx population. Then you have lots of hungry lynx. And they eat all of the rabbits, and so the rabbit population decreases, and then the lynx starve, and their population decreases. Then there's hardly any lynx to 
um, predate on the snowshoe hares. So then the snowshoe hare population grows dramatically, and now you're back to square one where you have a plentiful snowshoe hare population. So we do find these sorts of cyclic um, populations in nature. Now, how about the human population? Well, from about 2,000 to 500 years ago, we had very high mortality and the rates of births and deaths were about equal. And the world population was about 300 million. Um, then what happens is we have a transition. We call this the demographic transition. So with the demographic transition, we have um, several features in play here. We have the agricultural revolution, we have the industrial revolution. And what this does is it provides more food, advances in medicine, and so the rate of deaths decrease. With the rates of deaths decreasing, people continue to reproduce at the rate um, which they had before, because um, as you may know, um, traditional uh, birth control methods like uh, condoms and uh, birth control tablets really only became widespread in their use after about the 1960s and 1970s. So we had this period of time where you have very high birth rates and low death rates and the population increases dramatically. We are now getting to the point where birth rates are starting to decline as well. And in some populations, such as in Scandinavia and Australia, the populations are in great decline. But in other parts of the world, like in Africa, we have continued population increases. We're currently at the point where it still looks like the human population is growing exponentially, but we have already surpassed um, a reasonable carrying capacity, especially if you think about um, carbon dioxide levels. And so a big question is, is how fast will the human population stabilize or will it decrease dramatically as a result of overshooting our carrying capacity? And I'll let you think about that a little while.